Good morning, Caitlin. Good morning. Hey, Avery. Dr. Dumoncus, that was a fantastic speech. I agree. Thank you so much. How are you doing? Hey, hey Nate, uh, Dr. Simmons, what time are we going to start? Right at 9 30. It looks like many of the initial, oh. the round one speakers have already logged on. So I don't see any reason to postpone beyond 30. So we'll probably get started right on time. Dr. Sullivan, it's good to see you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. morning. <clears throat> How are all the students doing this morning? You guys good? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Anybody have questions before we start? I don't think so. Oh, everybody's good. I like your background, Dr. Kite. Thanks so much. Yeah. <laughs> Yours is beautiful. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. 
If you have not had a chance to sign in, I've included a link to the sign in sheet in the chat window. Um, if you don't have the chat window open yet, if you just hover over the Zoom window itself, the toolbar pops up along the bottom. You'll see a little button that says chat. You open that up and you should see um, a Google Forms link. Copy and paste that into a browser. It just asks for your name and um, your status. That, that helps us keep track of everyone who's participating. Thanks. <clears throat> Dr. Sammons, do you have uh, hosting abilities? I pass the host to you for this session. Okay. Um, so I will, once we get started at 9.30, um, I'll mute all. Um, and selectively unmute. Hopefully the schedule is the same as before. It sure is. Okay. Pretty smoothly. Is my thing supposed to say that it's recording? Yeah, yes, it is. we are recording the session. Um, and I'll make that announcement uh, when, we, when we actually formally begin. But we are recording. So if you're seeing that on your screen, everything is as it should be. So um, okay. no picking of noses, because it will be <laughs> at this time. <laughs> OK, thanks. Who all got their Scholar Day shirt in the mail already? I got mine yesterday. Excellent. Mine came in yesterday as well. I'm wearing it, but you can't really see the word yet. Yeah. It's awesome. I like the little, the, you designed the little. No, the, the, uh, the logo was designed by Liz um, from last year. We just kind of recycled it. And then we mm -hmm. added the white bicycle this year. You. One less to commemorate the unique, uh, the unique setup that we have this this year. It'll probably return to the old emblem next year, but it'll be a collector's item. So, hang on to that shirt. Nice, <laughs> for sure. A couple more minutes. <clears throat> Before we actually begin, I'll kind of go through a little bit about how it's going to go for those of you that did not make it to our practice run. Uh, it went really smoothly on, on Tuesday when we, when we went through a, an abbreviated version of this, but there are some things that I'll probably highlight before we actually jump off and, and begin. And if there are any questions, 
you can either ask now or you can feel free to wait and ask those questions after our rundown. When we, once we begin, I'll actually be reading from a script. So it's gonna sound very scripted. Um, and although we certainly have the ability to deviate from that, we'll probably stick to it pretty closely so that we maintain a, our strict timeline since we have three sessions to get through today. Um, we have about a minute left. It's great to see that uh, all of our session one presenters have already arrived. So does anyone have any questions before we, before we start off? And remember, you are, you're muted, so you'll have to unmute yourself uh, to speak. Okay, good. Well, let's go ahead and begin then. So we have five uh, speakers this morning in, in session number one. We have five speakers in session two and six speakers in session number three. I'm going to invite each of the speakers up one by one. They're going to unmute themselves or our room moderator, who is Michael, will unmute them for you. We will listen to their talk and then there'll be uh, several minutes, three minutes for questions. Questions can be handled either by typing it into the chat box and I can read them off to the presenter, or you can use the raise my hand feature. And if you don't know where that is, uh, hover your mouse uh, off to the right, if you can see there, click on the raise my hand button and uh, an icon will show up. Uh, the room moderator will unmute you and you can ask your question that way, okay? Any last minute questions before we dive off into the fun this morning? Yes, I have one, uh, Ned. Yes. Uh, that, that is about the judging form. Uh, when are we going to get the uh, participant number? Uh, who, who is going to tell us that? That's an excellent question. I will read off the participant number as I introduce them. So you'll know, you'll know exactly uh, okay. which, which, which number to put into that form. That's a good All question. Right. Okay, thanks. Okay, why don't we begin? Hello and welcome to session number one. If you have not already done so, please complete the sign-in form and you can see a link to that in the chat box. If you cannot locate the sign-in sheet, you can also locate this form by browsing to the Scholar Day webpage. Before we begin, please note that this section is being recorded and it is already being recorded now. In this session, we will have five students presenting their research from the biology and the maps departments, and I will introduce each presenter and read a little about their uh, presentation. Presenters, please share your screen while I am introducing you. Please note, biology students, you will have seven minutes to present your work and three minutes to answer questions, and map students will have five minutes to present with two minutes for questions. I will give you a one minute warning. Judges, I will also be providing you with the participant ID number, which will go at the top of your judging forms. All attendees will be muted throughout the presentations. If you have any questions for the participants, please write them in the chat feature and we will read them to the presenter at the end of the presentation. Let's begin. First, we have Ashley Deschotel presenting her work titled Louisiana Raccoons, Infestation with uh, Basilicaris Prokinoes in rural and urban settings. I'm sure she will pronounce that scientific name correctly for you once she begins. Judges, please note the participant ID number for your form is 77. Please join me in welcoming Ashley. Hello. It's saying it's disabled for screen sharing. Can y'all see my screen? Not yet, but I think Michael's working on getting you those permissions now. Okay, try again. There we go, that's it. Good morning. My name is Ashley Destels, and I'm presenting my research on the Louisiana raccoons infestation with Bayless scarsus personius in rural and urban settings. So 
So a little background information, um, raccoons are small omnivores and they're found in most parts of the United States. Um, the Bayless scarsus personius is a parasitic roundworm and it's found in its definitive host, the raccoon. Um, yeah. So it takes around two to four weeks for the eggs to become infective once they um, are released into the environment from the raccoon. And in ideal conditions, these eggs can stay good for, stay infected for several months and even up to several years in uh, moist environments. Um, I think I missed it. The roundworms, the adult roundworms, they produce, can produce up to 100,000 eggs per day. So a heavily infested raccoon can shed thousands into its environment. Um, so Bayless scarsus personius, it causes a zoonotic disease um, in other mammals called uh, larval migrants, which is usually, it's deadly if it's not caught early. It causes neurological problems and even death. So the primary objective was to generate preliminary data about the distribution of these roundworms in Louisiana. It was a continuation of my last project. And so this one was, um, I also compared the prevalence between the spring and autumn seasons. And I hypothesized that it might be different based on different locations and also different climate changes. So I, samples were collected from different, from rural and urban locations. I used a Sheathers modified sugar solution to process the samples and also use a fecal flotation technique to collect the eggs. So, um, after I let the, um, the eggs set in these tubes for about 15 minutes and then added a cover slip for another 10 minutes, it gave time for the eggs to adhere to the cover slip and then was placed on a micro microscope slide to analyze. And to calculate the total eggs per gram, took the total number of eggs that were found and divided by three, gives the eggs per gram. Here um, is a couple images. Figure two is the eggs that were uh, seen. They're large eggs compared to other ones that were actually seen in the samples. And figure three is a larva that we uh, found. And in one of them, I don't have it here, but we also were able to see a live larva underneath the microscope, which was pretty cool. Um, so the results are sam samples from both uh, rural and urban settings did test positive for um, Bayless scarsus personius. So this study provides a message of the prevalence for rural and urban settings so that they, they can be found and precautions should be taken. It also concluded that there are higher prevalence rates um, rural settings compared to urban and more samples were tested positive in uh, of the samples that were collected in the fall compared to the spring. Here's a chart, it is, it's a breakdown of the samples collected in both areas and the spring and the fall. And they have the prevalence rates of each one. And it shows that the rural were higher and fall samples were uh, more, prevalence in the fall were higher than in the spring. 
<laughs> so of the 70 samples that total total samples that were collected, 47 were positive. And that's almost 70 percent. It's a high percentage rate. Um, 41 percent, about 41 percent of the rural samples tested positive compared to about 25 percent of the urban samples. And a little less than 50% of the samples that were collected in the spring tested positive compared to the 80% positive of the ones that were collected in the fall. So overall, there was a significant difference between the samples collected in rural settings compared to the urban and also a significant difference between the samples collected in the fall compared to the spring months. I'd like to thank the biological department and the Chancellor's Faculty Fund for providing the, the supplies needed to conduct this research and my mentor, Dr. Kite, for his guidance and support throughout the whole project. Thank you. I can't hear you, Dr. Sammons. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that presentation. It was excellent. For those of you that are watching um, and you're and you know you're muted like I was just now and you want to react you can click on the react hover down at the base of your uh, screen uh, the reactions and if you click on the on the word reactions it can, you can either select thumbs up you can do clapping and it'll show up there next to you on your picture you can see Michael's doing so I'm, uh, I have the, the clapping icon as well so we're going to move on to questions now we have three minutes for questions so we'll start the timer um, and again, you can either type your questions into the chat box or you can raise your hand and um, our room moderator, Michael, will unmute you and you can progress with your questions. I'll, I'll ask a question. So how, how does your research impact the health of the community then? What, what type of impact do you feel like it would have? You need to unmute, Ashley. I believe it, it, aware, it raises awareness that and there is raccoons everywhere. And it doesn't like, you're not more protected if you're in urban settings or whatnot. But I think with rural settings, they're more, there's more raccoons. So it, it kind of lets you, um, you know, you should watch out, definitely not play with the feces. And more or less for, um, for kids, because they're not sure, you know, they don't know what it is. And if they pick it up or touch it or whatnot, um, and if, you know, they touch their mouth or anything, they have a chance of, becoming infected with it. <clears throat> Cause they also, they're known to um, use like sandboxes or as to use, where they use the bathroom and kids play and everything. I think that's a good thing. Actually, <clears throat> oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> I typed a question that is about the size of the eggs. I don't know if she has seen that. Uh, what is the average size of the eggs? It's a really good question. I don't remember the exact numbers. I just know they're, they are larger than most of other parasitic eggs, but then the numbers are not 100% sure. Uh, I can say about the size of the eggs. Uh, it's uh, somewhere between uh, 60 to 88 micrometer uh, by 50 to maybe 70, 75. Uh, micrometer in size. Thank you, Dr. Kite. And uh, I want to congratulate actually 
uh, Ashley for the wonderful uh, presentation as well. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you. Ashley, Dr. Bowers has a question for you as well. She would, uh, she would ask you, how can you treat your pets to prevent an infestation? Um, they're, for pets, a lot of them, they use, um, I think it's fin, fin, finbenzol, I might not pronounce it right, or um, albins, albinzol, if I'm, I'm pronouncing it wrong, I know, but um, the brand name is Panicure, I know that much, but they use that um, to usually deworm if your animal has it, and they also use it in raccoons. It won't kill the eggs, but it will kill the worms. Okay, um, this is Michael, and I'm reading a question from Sue Sullivan, who asks, what did you learn about research overall with the ability to do a continued study? Um, definitely with this one, the more data, obviously better results. Um, I mean, with this study by itself, I learned like, a few techniques on processing the samples and everything, which will help because I'm trying to get into vet school. That's my goal. So it gave me insight on that and I just, I learned a few techniques with it. And research is pretty fun. It's a lot of work, but it's fun. Well, thank you very much, Ashley. And um, I know I can speak for all of us in the room. You did a fantastic job. Next, we have Caitlin Lanclaw presenting her work entitled do multiple eastern wood rats use a den and are they aggressive towards con specifics? For judges, her student ID number is nine or her judging number is nine. Um, and I will turn it over to Caitlin. All righty. Hi, I'm Caitlin. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna start off with the introduction. Eastern wood rats are medium-sized rodents that are found in various habitats, which include marshes, grasslands, forests, and coastal plains. Their geographic range lies within the eastern deciduous forest, but it also extends into grasslands of the coastal plains. These rats are known to build inconspicuous and conspicuous nests, which can be found on the forest floor as well as in the trees. Murphy has found that Osage wood rats are solitary creatures that occupy the houses that they build and live there alone with the exception of breeding season and while rearing young. However, other researchers have found that dusky footed wood rats are known to visit several conspecific dens found within their home range. Kinsey also found that they exhibit that Allegheny wood rats exhibit territorial defense of individual sites and can be grouped into two separate categories the dominant individuals that defend territory and the subordinate rats that are live in communal groups and avoid the dominance. My objectives for this study were to determine if wood rat dens are being visited or, or occupied by more than one individual. I also wanted to determine if the cameras captured burrow entrances and exits equally and if they had a dominant burrow. And I also wanted to determine if the wood rats exhibit any signs of aggression when there are multiple rats present. My hypothesis for the study are that the, the dens were utilized by more than one individual. The cameras will capture the entrances and exits equally. There will be a dominant burrow and there will be signs of aggression. My study site was located at the Dean Lee Research and Extension Station, which is adjacent to the LSUA campus. A 15 by 15 meter grid was established and contains lines A through W. Each line consists of 13 points. This study site is deemed a bottom limb hardwood forest and is primarily has ground cover is ground cover is primarily composed of palmettos, but other species include oak, pecan, sweet gum, and sugarberry. Live traps were set out for two weeks starting on October 13, and they were baited with pecans and checked daily. These live traps were faced were placed facing open burrows and also parallel with fallen logs. Captured rats were weighed, sexed, and if needed, given a pit and ear tag. And they were also marked with a distinctive pattern into the shoulders and haunches using dog grooming clippers. These markings were used for individual identification with the cameras. We also used Moultrie game cameras that were 
used to identify and observe the wood rat behaviors. These were placed on stakes pounded in the ground or placed on trees where appropriate. I also used data from cameras that were suspended seven and a half feet in the air on tripods. And I also used photos from a 2016-2017 study. I used a sign test to determine whether the dens were more likely used by one or more individuals. It was also used to determine whether these dens were more likely to have a dominant burrow or not obviously dominant burrow. A chi-square analysis was used to determine if the cameras captured the entrances and exits equally, and the aggression data was unable to be analyzed statistically because we didn't have enough info. These are results of the sign test for the evidence of individuals or multiples occupying the nest. We had observed 21 nests and we had found three, three nests with one individual and 18 nests with more than one individual. This shows that there was a significant difference with nests having more than one individual. Here are my results of the chi-square to determine if the cameras capture the entrances and exits equally. We observed 22 nests for this. We found 504 entrances and 329 exits. And this also shows that there is a significant difference in entrances being used more than the exits. Here are the results of my sign test for evidence of a dominant burrow. We observed 22 nests. Nine, nine nests showed a burrow preference. Five showed no preference and eight nests were unsure. Therefore, this data is not significant. And here are my results for the aggression in wood rats. I observed a total of 30,480 photos. Out of this many photos, only 116 photos contained pictures of multiple rats. 103 were pictures with two adults, while 13 were pictures with adults and juvenile, and I observed no signs of aggression. My data suggests that eastern wood rats are not as solitary as they were previously thought to be. This may be due to the high density of the wood rats in my study area. These rats may also be exhibiting temporary relationships like similar to the dusky footed wood rats. Cameras may capture entrances more than exits because they fail to record fast motions. Throughout the study, the rats showed they, that they exited the burrows a lot faster than they entered the burrows. Predation may also play a role in the speed at which they enter and exit. And we also may not have had placed cameras at all burrows that are used for exits. There may have been no evidence of a dominant burrow because there was a limited number of camera which led to the uneven monitoring of the burrows. The rats may also use the burrows differently. For example, they might use one for entering and one for exiting. Although the results were insignificant, there was evidence of dens with dominant burrows because some burrows were used several times, whereas some were not used at all. This study needs to be investigated further because knowing which, which burrow is dominant will limit the time and equipment needed for similar studies in the future. And out of all the photos I analyzed, I observed no signs of aggression and the rats were not subdivided into two groups. Some behaviors that I did observe include nose touching, playing, a mother with her babies, or no interaction at all. This may be due to the rats exhibiting temporary behavior seen in outwater rats and dusky footed rats. Therefore, my data suggests that the eastern wood rats may not be territorial nor solitary. To conclude, we found that a den is usually used or visited by multiple rats. The cameras captured more entrances than exits. There was not enough data to determine if rats had a dominant burrow. And there was no evidence of aggressive behavior among conspecific rats. While both trapping methods provided useful information on these behaviors, the camera trapping was more useful for this type of behavioral study. Thank you. And I would like to thank Dr. Corbett for everything she did and Dean Lee. Very nice job, Caitlin. Um, I now open the floor for questions. Go ahead and unshare your screen, perfect. Uh, I am not sure how to do that. <laughs> um, okay. So Caitlin, what, other than Dr. Corbett, because I know how interested she is in rats, 
what prompted your interest in this study? Like, what made you want to do this? Well, I know we have several professors that have several different expertise. And I know that I want to work with mammals, for instance, the ones with hair. So that is exactly what I told Dr. Corbett whenever she was scheduling me for research. She was like, well, who do you want to do it with? And I said, well, I want little furry animals. And honestly, she was the best option. <laughs> It was very fun though. Kind of scary, but fun. All right, do we have any additional questions? Fantastic, great job, Caitlin. Uh, next up is Avery Lemoyne. She will be presenting her work titled Nest Building Materials of the Eastern Wood Rat in Central Louisiana. Judges, please note that the participant ID number on your for your form is 56 for this student. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Avery Lemoyne. Avery, go ahead and share your screen and you will be ready to go. Can everyone see it? Sure can, it looks great. Okay, so as Dr. Salmon said, I'll be presenting my research on the nest building materials of Eastern wood rats in central Louisiana. Um, the Eastern wood rat, Neotoma floridana, is a medium-sized rodent that occurs throughout the southeastern United States. They're mostly known for the construction of above-ground stick houses. However, they are known to nest in different types of houses. For instance, Northern populations nest in rock crevices, and southern populations nest in ground burrows, as well as the root masses of wind-thrown trees. The exterior of these stick houses are made of sticks that are tightly woven together to serve as protection from weather and predators. And most houses contain somewhere between two to three um, entrances and exits. Um, from the exterior into the interior of the house. The interior of the house is composed of passageways that lead to the various chambers within the house. Um, two of the known chambers used by eastern wood rats are one, the nest, which is lined with soft vegetative material and is only for sleeping, giving birth, and nursing young. A second chamber known for Use, known to be used by eastern wood rats is the food cache, which is only used for food storage. The objective of this study was to determine what building materials are most commonly used by eastern wood rats in this area, in central Louisiana. The site that I performed my study on is a bottomland hardwood forest that belongs to the Dean Lee Research and Extension Station. Within the forest is a 15 by 15 meter grid um, with transect lines A through W, and each line contains 13 evenly placed points. This is a satellite photo of the study site. The methods that we used to begin, we walked each transect line and searched for nests with above ground components that appear to be active. Um, when we came upon one of these nests, we recorded the location to have cameras placed at these nests. Um, in addition to the photos captured in my two, 2019 study, I also examined photos from a previous study in fall 16 and spring 17. Of I examined, examined all the photos and sorted them into five categories, depending on which type of building material was being carried by the rats. Stick, twig, leaf, palmetto, and other, which was composed of wood chunks and artificial um, materials such as camera straps and paper. After all of these were sorted, um, a chi-square test was performed to see which was used most commonly. 
I examined over 30,000 photos, but only 307 of those photos actually showed rats carrying any type of material. Um, of all the material carried, sticks made up a, a significantly greater proportion of um, material. And second came in, palmetto came in second. And twigs, leaves, and other were rather proportionate in use. In conclusion and discussion, the, um, the twigs on through the photos, from the photos, the twigs were mainly used to fill in the gaps on the exterior between the larger sticks They were filled in the gaps. And the leaves were seen being brought into the nest, probably to be used as a bedding for the nest. They were being brought into the houses, I'm sorry. It's probably to be used as bedding for the nests. But what was surprising about this study was that sticks were used significantly more than palmetto leaflets. Given the abundance of palmetto leaflets um, on this study, available on this study site. I speculate that sticks were used more because um, they offer more stability than palmetto leaflets um, for the exterior construction. Also, sticks could be more efficiently moved to the nest because they can just be picked up and carried to the nest, whereas the palmetto leaflets actually have to be gnawed from the fronds in order to be easily transported to back to the nest. This gnawing is kind of noisy and it takes extra time and that could increase the chances of the rat being preyed upon. Some improvements that could be made to make this, for this study to be more um, time efficient and accurate is um, in, uh, camera placement could be improved because not all building material was visible in the photos. For instance, um, I get a photo of a rat bringing in material, but then he would go behind the nest or something. You couldn't see what he was actually doing with the material. And some of the pictures were rather dark, so you had to adjust the lighting and all that to be able to tell what kind of material he was carrying. So that was not very time efficient. So for future studies, um, you can make those, those improvements could be made um, that would make the research more time efficient. And also, another curiosity that this study sparked of mine was um, what, when are these rats building, most actively building the nests? And I didn't really have time to, in the study, to determine this, but for future studies, this could be something that's looked at. Um, you could use the data from the photos and determine what's the most active time according to date and temperature. I would like to thank Dr. Corbett for being my mentor, the Dean Lee Research and Extension Station for letting me use their property, and Tara Pruitt for letting me use her photo data. And this is the literature I used. Thank you. Fantastic, great job, uh, Avery. Does anyone have any questions? And remember, you must unmute yourself, or you How can- I unshare the screen? Yeah. Yes, uh, I have a question, Avery. Uh, yes. This is Aleka. Uh, when you talked about the uh, problem with the placement of the camera, uh, what would you suggest? Uh, how to place it or at what, at what height you have to place it? Or? Um, well, I didn't, you, I, I did use a few, but I was main, I wasn't able to use the tripod cameras for my study as much as the state cameras. Um, the thing that I could see would make the, that would improve the study the most is to put more cameras around the perimeter of the nest. That way you can see from all different angles. So if you say more uh, around say three, four or five or Probably more along the lines of five because we did place three at most nests, at least three. Okay. All right, thank you. 
you. Oh. I have a question from the um, chat from Dr. Gilliland. She asked, how do you prevent your human scent from disrupting the habitat? Um, I'm not really sure how to answer that question, but it did not seem to have an effect at all because we got a lot of activity on camera. Um, just not all of it was them carrying building material. Dr. Sue Sullivan also has a question. Uh, she would like to ask, at the beginning of the study, how do you decide if the nest appears active? Oh, we um, looked for definitely nests with above ground components since I wanted to um, research the sick nests particularly. And um, we looked at the entrances and if they appeared to be not well traveled or if they had spider webs, then they probably were not active. Or if they were, if it was a burrow, if it was um, dug out too big for the size of a wood rat, we knew that it was probably taken over by an armadillo or something and no longer used by a wood rat. Any additional questions for Avery? Okay, great, great job, Avery. Uh, that concludes our biology presentations. We're now going to move on to two presentations from the MAPS department. The first presentation will be by Alexis Perkins, who unfortunately could not be here today with us. Instead, she has sent her presentation to me, so I will be presenting that via the share screen uh, for you. You go ahead and get that set up now before I do her introduction, and then I will play it for you. Can everyone see the screen that I'm sharing? Good morning. My name is Alexis Perkins. It is great to see you all, and thank you for coming together today and allowing me to present my project to you. Before I begin, I would like to give you a little background as to why I'm unable to give you my presentation live. As we are all well aware, a viral infection, COVID-19, has been sweeping the globe for many months now. While pursuing my Bachelor of Science in Mathematics, I was blessed with the opportunity to work as a registration clerk the past couple of years at my local hospital in the emergency room. This experience, coupled with a deep desire to help my fellow human, afforded me the chance to use my knowledge in a city with great need, New York. Working in Lincoln Hospital has opened my eyes to the tragedies of COVID-19 and has brought with it a whirlwind of emotions that are only quelled by the knowledge that I am doing the greatest good for the greatest number of people. I would not want to be anywhere else in the world right now. As this presentation is played out before you, I will be working. I have created it differently in hopes of replicating my presence with you. Thank you for the opportunity to present my project to you, and I hope you find the following presentation informative. During this time, we will be discussing the servo motor coupled with a potentiometer. I have used the Arduino open source electronics platform and Java programming to complete this project. We will control the position of a servo monitor using Arduino and a potentiometer. Our servo will be wired with three wires, power, ground, and signal. The potentiometer will also be wired with power, ground, and signal as well. In order to complete this project, I had to have several components and supplies. They included the Arduino Uno, a SG90 micro server motor, a rotary potentiometer, and eight generic jumper wires. Speaking of jumper, let's jump to the next slide. Let's talk about design and working processes now. The positional rotation servo is the most important and the most common type of servo today. Its shaft rotates about 180 degrees with each motor having minor variances. Physical stops are placed in the gear mechanism to prevent moving beyond the 180 degree range in order to protect the rotation sensors. Contained within a hobby servo are four main components. A DC motor, a gearbox, a potentiometer, and last but certainly not least, the control circuit, or the brains if you will. The DC motor is equipped with a high speed and naturally has exceptionally low torque. The gearbox is designed to slow the motor down and bring the motor's torque higher. Servos are equipped with the pulse width modulation principle, also known as PWM. 
What is PWM? It simply means the angle of rotation is controlled by the pulse's duration applied to the servo's control. Servo motors are closed loop servo mechanisms that utilize feedback from position to control motion and find its final position. Input is an analog or digital signal that represents a positional command that is executed on the output shaft. Attached to the final gear of the output shaft is the potentiometer. As the motor rotates, so does the potentiometer, or vice versa. With this movement, voltage is produced and is related to the absolute angle of the output shaft. On the control unit, in this case our Arduino, the voltages are compared, allowing the motor to move in either direction until both signals equal a difference of zero. This is a very simple motor that operates at full speed and does not have many industrial uses, but is a cheap and simple method for learning and hobbyists alike. An example of an industrial servo motor are ones that are used in optical rotary encoders. They measure output shaft and variable speed drive to control motor speed. Overshooting is minimized in these types of servos by implementing a PID control Putting it all together, the servo motor controls its position and speed very precisely. The potentiometer senses the position of the shaft. The position is converted into an electrical pulse and compared to the command input signal. Any difference in the feedback signal is treated as an error causing rotation of the motor until the difference becomes zero. At zero, the motor stops rotation. A servo motor can rotate 90 degrees in either direction, stopped on either side by mechanical stops. A PWM pulse is sent every 20 milliseconds and determines the actual position of the motor based on the width of the pulse being sent. This pulse must continue to be sent due to the motor's resistance to change. Without it, the motor would not hold position. Here we have the Java program used to allow the servo and potentiometer to work with each other. As far as coding goes, it is a quite simple program. On a basic level, it detects servo position and moves the shaft according to the input from the user. Our flowchart shows how this algorithm plays out. We declare variables and assign a pin number to those variables. We then determine which are input and which are output. These are used to translate motor shaft position and move them accordingly. Here I have laid out a more visual approach to how the servo motor works. As you can see, as feedback from the potentiometer position changes, so does the position of the servo arm. The biggest problems when running a simple circuit like this are programming errors and wire misplacement. On such a simplistic project, there are not a lot of things that can go wrong, but as these systems grow, so do their problems. Equipment failure can be a problem, but generally is not the case in small projects like these. Here we have the finished project represented on a digital platform. As I rotate the potentiometer, the shaft of my servo motor rotates. It is using the pulses generated in order to determine the position it should be in. Servo motors allow for controlled mechanical output and fine motor control. It is a good example of a single invention that will pave the way for great advancements. Used in hobbies and industrial applications, it has made its way into robotics. It allows for fine coordinated movements that can be utilized in artificial intelligence to create beings that look more and more humanistic. We are a long way from such accomplishments, but we are well on our way. Thank you for enjoying my presentation. I appreciate the time you have taken to listen. Excellent job, Alexis. If you're watching this uh, because it is being recorded, if you're coming back to watch it afterward, uh, I can speak for all of us that we very much enjoyed uh, that presentation. And thank you for spending the time, even though you're very, very busy at the moment, uh, putting that together. Uh, for judges, uh, the, uh, the presenter number for Alexis uh, was 48. Do you want to update your screens? Again, that was 48. Our final presenter this morning uh, will be Jacob Chagnard, and he will be presenting his work entitled 
music using Piezo. Judges, please note that the participant ID number for your form is Casey. There's Chad here. I did see him earlier. He may have gotten into some technological issues, so we can wait here for a few minutes and see if he comes back on. Let me, as we're waiting uh, for, for the judges, I'm going to go back and list all of the student participant numbers just one more time in a quick review. Uh, the first speaker was Ashley uh, Deschotel and her number was 77. She was followed by Caitlin Lanclaw. Her number was nine. She was followed by Avery Lemoyne, whose number was 56. Alexis Perkins was the uh, penultimate presenter today. Her number was 48. And now we're waiting for Jacob, whose number is 80. See if he has arrived. Go back and see when he Michael, can you look at the participant list and see if he was here earlier? What we may need to do is work him into a later session, uh, which will be no problem at all. It'll be very easy to just fit him in. We'll have some extra time uh, and he will be able to present then if, if he cannot find his way back in here. Yeah, I don't see him in the participants list. Um, and I'm not sure how to look at a log. If right. any participants had entered the room and then left, um, they disappear from my participant list. So um, there's also the issue of people renaming themselves or coming in with confusing names. Um, but I don't see um, anyone named Jacob uh, Chagnard anywhere in here. So sorry, I can't help out. That's all right. What we'll do if Jacob comes, we will just work him into a later session. That won't be a problem, but we, uh, we still very much value his work. And uh, I did see he was in a practice session on Tuesday, so I know he uh, is intending to present. So hopefully we'll catch up with him then. That officially ends session one. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much, presenters. You, you all did a fantastic job, uh, not only with your presentations, but with your delivery today as well. We appreciate the hard work that you've done, not only in doing the research, which I know many of you put at least an entire semester's worth of work into, but then also the time now when your lives are tremendously chaotic with the wrapping up of the semester, you, you put the extra time in to build these presentations and to practice this. So um, let me give you the applause uh, reaction here from me and congratulations. Thank you and great job. Hopefully I will see all of you in session two, which starts at 10.30. So we'll pause here, take a break, and we'll meet back at 10.30.